open rebellion. Open. The door is open. Not like the door is open. Like something that's not hidden. You can have something that's hidden and closed, or you can have something that's open. And then rebellion, rebelling against the right thing that you know you're supposed to do. Um, I'm going to have Seth and Zeb read here in just a minute, but before we get there, uh, I wanted to teach you a new word, or at least a new use of a, an old word. Um, somebody tell me a word that describes your this past week. If you could describe your whole week in one word, what would that word be? Chaotic. Chaotic. Slow. Slow. Tiring. Tiring. Busy. Busy? Fast. So we have fast and slow. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. I'm going to, before I forget, tell me your name again. Caleb. Caleb's going to pray. Um, and then uh, I'm going to teach you a new word. Go ahead and pray for us, Caleb. Caleb. Dear God, we thank you for this weekend that you've allowed us to all to be here. Uh, allow us to take some of the right things back. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Caleb. So if you had a particular week where every time you woke up, this person was on your mind because they always were, you know, whatever. They were intimidating you or they were, like, pushing you around. And you just, you, you woke up and you're like, this is going to be a great day. And you're like, ah, but... This person is going to be in my day. All right? Bully, harass. There you go. You know the definition of that word, don't you? Which is weird, right? Because normally you think of the fluffy cow you're not supposed to pet, right? The shirt, right? Don't pet the fluffy cows. Buffalo, it's a, it's a creature, okay? Now, play along with me. If this creature was from a certain northeastern state, they have a football team. You might call them the Bills. Buffalo Bills. <laughs> so follow me here. You've got an animal from a location, a buffalo buffalo. And then as Zeb said, what's the meaning of buffalo as a, an action word? Okay. To harass. So if... Someone is harassing you. I'm not kidding. They are buffaloing you. So, a New York bison intimidates you. Right? Now, here's where it gets really crazy. A New York bison buffaloes. What could they possibly buffalo? New York bison. <laughs> Get it? You could just keep adding buffalo on the end of this. A buffalo buffalo buffaloes. A New York buffalo. We're up to five of the same word, and you could put a period on that sentence, and you would have a complete sentence using one word. You're like, why is this guy talking about buffalo? You're thinking that. It's like, this is weird. I didn't want to come to English class on a Saturday afternoon. Here's the trick. Seth, are you ready? Yeah. I am going to read Deuteronomy 11.25, and then you are going to reread it, but you are going to use buffalo as a verb in the place where it fits. All right, you can do this. Now remember, buffalo means to to withstand or to intimidate, okay? So this really isn't going to be as hard as you think it's going to be. Get ready, Zeb, because it's coming for you next, okay? All right, I'm going to read it. Deuteronomy 11, 25. No one shall be able to stand against you. Are you listening? Yeah. No one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread. Reread it, but put buffalo in its proper place. No one will be able to buffalo against you. There you go. No one can buffalo you. Who's on your side? Okay. Now that's talking about God's people. Welcome. Come on in. Zeb, we're going to go 2 Chronicles 20 because this gets... This gets even more specific. Okay, Zeb, do I need to read it first, or do you think you can handle it on your own? Nah. Okay, 2 Chronicles 20, 5 through 6. Megan, right there. 
Boom. One seat. Have a seat. Everyone knows you're here. All right. Second Chronicles 20, 5 through 6. Listen up. And Jehoshaphat, Buffalo, in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord, before the new court, and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You buffalo all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none are able to buffalo you. So, can anyone resist God? The Bible is telling us that there is no one who can stand against and can resist God. Now, you can question God, right? Mr. Joe talked about that. You can ask questions of God. What is the name Israel? What does that name mean? You guys know what Israel means? God with us. Not quite. Close. Nice try, though. I appreciate that. The one who wrestled God? Yes. Israel. Israel is God's people in the Old Testament. And it's even referred to God's New Testament people. The name of God's people was what? Those who wrestled with God. So God's people are not just those who just understand God. Those are, God's people are those who wrestle with Him. However, if you want to get at God and defeat Him, you can't do it. It's impossible. So, what do you do if there is somebody that you want to get at, but you can't do anything against them? Think about your parents. I mean, you're not supposed to strike your parents. But say they do something that irritates you. If you can't get at your parents, who do you take it out on? Daughters. Who? Daughters. Say daughters. daughters. What? Daughters. Siblings? <laughs> yeah, your parents do something to irritate you, and you can't get back at them, so you take it out on a sibling. Yeah. You buffalo your sibling. <laughs> what about your siblings? Maybe you're not supposed to, to hurt them. What might you do to their stuff if you can't get back at your siblings? You go after their things. You got, have you guys ever done that? You ever had that happen to you? You can't get at somebody, and so you take it out? That's what the world does. The world knows that they can't, they can't take out God. And so if you can't get at God, who do you go after? Well, anyone made in his image. We're not just talking about the church here. We're talking about the negative things of this world that hurt people. That is these forces that know that they can't get at God, and so they go after those who are made in God's image, which is everyone in this room, and it's everyone that God has made. So if you can't destroy God, you go after the thing that he made. Let's go over to 1 Samuel 15. I want to look at this story of King Saul. Um, something is trying to convince Saul to stand against God. And even though Saul knows that God is unstoppable, he has these different strategies for trying to survive his rebellion against God. Saul knows you can't rebel against God. But he tries these things to kind of keep it hidden and distract from, from God. So let's read this first part of 1 Samuel 15 just to make sure we understand uh, the beginning of this story. 1 Samuel 15. Uh, Samuel, who is a prophet, comes to Saul, who is a king. And Samuel says, The Lord sent me to anoint you, Saul, king, over all Israel. Israel means wrestled with God. Now, listen to my words. I have taken notice of Amalek, what they did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. What was Israel doing when they came up out of Egypt? You guys remember? You know? You guys know? What was Israel doing when they came out of Egypt? Caleb, do you know? Yeah, that was one thing they were doing. Where were they coming from, though? Was it like Happy Town? No, no. <laughs> they came out of slavery with nothing, so they were vulnerable. 
And what did Amalek do to them when they were vulnerable? I have taken note of Amalek because when Israel was coming out of here, I'm going to give you guys something to, to think on and talk about for just a minute. We're going to look at some different strategies that Saul uses. But I want you guys, I'm going to write a couple words up here on the, word, on the board. You should know the definitions of these. And what I'd like you to do, just within, you don't have to like get in a group, but maybe like, you know, you three and you three and you three and you three. Just kind of talk amongst yourselves about how you would define these words. All right. So the first one is lie. The second one is excuse. And the third one is blame. So, Joshua, you're going to turn to the nice young lady next to you, and you're going to say, hello, my name is Joshua. What is your name? You know? I already know their names. Ah, excellent. Well, you're a step ahead. And you can say, I would like to know how you would define a lie. And then she's going to tell you what she thinks the definition of a lie is. And you're going to say, thank you so much for sharing that with me. I will now share this with Mr. Shipper. All right? So, back row, you don't all have to talk together, but amongst yourselves, I want you guys individually to talk about, come up with a definition for a lie. Second row. You ready, second row? You guys get to come up with a definition for what an excuse is. Front row. You guys get to define blame. And uh, the peanut gallery over here. You can talk about any of these three words that you want. No. All right, take a few minutes. Come up with a definition for the word I told you, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit. Good? All right. Uh, somebody from the back row, give me a brief definition of a lie. Uh, the act of saying something untruthful. Does anyone want to add to the act of speaking untruth? What? Nope. I'm going to add something to that because it is it is the act of speaking untrue, but 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 why? For your personal gain. Yes. Could also be twisting the truth. Yes. Here it is, guys. Seth is right. It is the act of speaking untruth in order to get the benefit of telling the truth. But you don't have to do the thing that you got out of. Okay? So, Saul comes to Samuel. Look here in, uh, look here in verse 13. And Samuel comes to Saul, and Saul goes to him, and he says... Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. What does Saul say? I lied. Well, yeah, he doesn't come up and say, I lied. <laughs> but he does tell the lie. He comes up and he says, I have done what God said. Notice what Samuel says here. Samuel kind of sits back. He listens. And you know what he hears off in the distance? He hears the sound of sheep. He says, What is this bleeding of sheep in my ears, and the lowing of oxen, and the grunting of buffalo? You think they had buffalo in Israel? Yeah. I think so. Absolutely. I have water down to the best. Now, let's go over to verse 20. You had said, uh, Caleb, you said something about twisting the truth. Verse 20. Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice, I listened. I went on the mission, and I brought you the king. You see how he's kind of twisting the words? He's saying, well, you told me to just wipe everyone out, but technically I did go, and I did listen, and I did bring you the thing. There's a guy at, at uh, a church that we've been, we, we've been working with, and, and he complains of, kind of being lonely and of needing friends. And so we're like, hey, you need to go to this small group Bible study, all right? So we said, are you going to go to small group Bible study on Friday night? And he said, there is small group Bible study on Friday night. Friday night happens. Saturday comes around. 
He didn't go. How did he get out of not going? What did he tell us? What did he tell us? What you wanted to do. What's the truth? That there is a Bible study. We asked him, are you going to go? And his response was, there is a Bible study. And we're like, why didn't you go? And he's like, well, I never told you I was going to go. See, everyone hates grammar when there's a grade. But we become grammar experts when it comes to getting out of what we don't want to do. We allow people to think this good thing about us when we have no intention of following through on it. Saul wants to be this great godly king in the eyes of people, but when it comes to doing the hard thing, he twists his words so it sounds like he did, but he doesn't. All right, who came up with a uh, definition for excuse? Is that middle row? Yep. Come on, middle row. What's an excuse? And don't give me an excuse that you didn't come up with an excuse. It's a reason to get out of something that you don't want to do. It's a reason to avoid what you don't want. What if I also said it's a reason to avoid what you don't really value? You like that? Or did I twist your words? You okay with that? Yeah. Verse 15. Go back to verse 15. Listen to what Saul says. Samuel says, hey, why do I hear sheep and oxen? And then Saul says, well, they brought the animals, the soldiers brought the animals from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen, to sacrifice to the Lord. So why did they not kill the stuff right away? God said, do it right away. Sacrifice it to me by killing it right away. And what did they do? No, they didn't. They said, well, we're going to do it later. This is what later means. Verse 12. Samuel found out that Saul had set up a monument to himself in Gilgal. So who was really Saul going to sacrifice all these animals to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when he catches them in it, he says, no, we were just going we to do it later. Okay? The thing that you make up an excuse to not do reveals the thing that you really don't value. The activity or the thing or the person that you never make up an excuse to be with, then that's the thing that you really value. The thing that you make up an excuse to get out of is the thing you don't value. And the thing that you never have to make up an excuse for is the thing that you really value. Uh, I remember, and I, this is kind of an odd rule, but it really wasn't terrible. So my mom did all the laundry, and so she believed if you wore clothes for a half day, you still had another half day to get out of those clothes. You ever heard of a rule like that? You ever wear jeans more than once? You don't wash jeans after one wear. So we would wear our clothes to church on Sunday, and Sunday was half a day. So guess what we had to wear to school on Monday? Same outfit. I showed up to school in my collared shirt and my khaki pants. Do you think any of my friends had those clothes on? No. And I argued with my mom, and I fought with my mom over this silly little rule, right? I made up all these excuses why I couldn't just do the simple thing she asked me to do. A couple years later, I joined the football team. I did not play football for very long, you can imagine, for obvious reasons. I joined the football team. Guess what the football coach said? Every Friday before game day, man, we are wearing a collared shirt, khaki pants, and a tie. Guess what I said? Absolutely, coach. No questions asked. I will submit to you gladly, and I will even help my teammates tie their tie. The person I made up an excuse to get out of meant I really didn't value what my mom was trying to do. The home, And I understand it was laundry, but you guys know your moms. They're trying to make a home, right? They're trying to provide the best for you. And I would make up these excuses that would just irritate her. 
And this high school, it wasn't even high school, this middle school coach, who I don't even have a relationship anymore, I never made up an excuse to do what he said. We always submit to something, right? Just because you don't submit to certain people in your life doesn't mean there's not others that you don't submit to. And so you can ask yourself, what do I make up excuses to get out of? And what's the thing in my life that I never make up an excuse to be a part of? All right, last thing. Let's get down to Saul, and let's get down to his, his, final, uh, his final reason here. Oh, we got to do this. Somebody give me a definition for blame. Uh, blame means to accuse someone of causing a problem for you that prevents you from doing a necessary task. So accuse another of obstructing or blocking your way. Yes. Anybody have anything else for blame? You guys were pumped about your definition. What is it? Uh, pushing the fault onto others. Ooh. Push fault to others. Could we also say pushing responsibility on others? Not taking responsibility. You guys have probably picked up on this by now. Verse 24, Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words. Why? Somebody look in verse 24 and tell me. Why did Saul do what he did? He feared the people and obeyed their voice. So who did he blame? The people. Who could buffalo Saul? Oh, who does he say? Who pushed Saul around? It was the people. Isn't that crazy? Here's a king. He's in charge of everyone. And when this preacher, this prophet comes up to him, and he's like, why'd you do it, man? He's like, the people made me do it. <laughs> like, of anybody to say, hey, the people wanted this, but God is the one who I know I can't withstand, of all people, to blame it on, on the people, it was, uh, it was Saul. And you might say, well, we weren't there, and so we don't understand the kind of pressure. All these people pressuring Saul to do this thing. And maybe that's true. But it's also true that the person who gets stirred up, the person who has their buttons pushed, always blames the person who pushes their buttons. You have people who push your buttons. You have people who know how to stir you up. You know what that means? The people who push your buttons, it means they have control over you. And I understand we might blame them once in a while for those kind of things, but if we make this habit of hiding our rebellion behind blame, then one day we're going to wake up and we're just going to be like, I've given up all control of my life. And that's a scary place to be, to think that you are unwilling to take responsibility for that kind of stuff. And that's where Saul is at, is he just continually blames and gives up responsibility and puts it over on other people. Whoever stirs you up has control over you. And so the question is, is do you let people stir you up? Or do you let God stir you up and motivate you? You know, guys, I would do this thing, except I know this is what God wants from me. But, of course, lying making excuses, blaming. That's all just like Old Testament stuff, right? This is an Old Testament story, and people don't use those, these things anymore, right? This is just Old Testament <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so what are some things, what are some behaviors that you guys know about or have heard of that people cover up by lying or making excuses or blaming? Attendance. Okay, not being somewhere. Church. Okay. Criminal activity. Well, that's a pretty broad brush. Yes. Criminal activity. Okay. What else? Responsibilities. Okay. Something that is your responsibility and you don't do it, and so then you... Okay. Very good. What else?
Staying what are some other things late. you guys see? What? Staying up too late. <laughs> yeah. That's where, what's your name? Cold. Cold. That's where morning cold blames how bad he feels on late night cold. There's two colds. There's the cult who stays up too late, and then there's the cult in the morning who has to pay for it, right? And late night cold is like, hey man, this is going to be awesome. And early morning cold is like, dude, why'd you do it again? Yeah, sometimes it's the battle within yourself, isn't it? 1 Samuel 15, 33. Do you guys know how this story ends? Uh, do you, what, what was the name of the king that they were supposed to kill at the beginning of the story? Do you remember the name? Agag. Agag. Very good. Do you know how the story ends? What do you think Samuel, Agag... Samuel what do you, yeah. What do you think Agag is thinking right now? Saul and Samuel are off over here arguing, and Agag is like, man, awesome. I'm not dead yet. Isn't that great? So look at verse 30, verse 32. Samuel says, bring Agag here, and Agag came cheerfully. What? How do you envision him coming cheerfully? I think he's got a little bounce his step. I think he's like you and the finger gun, winking, smiling. And he says, hey guys, surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel says, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord. Now, who wants to see that scene made into a movie? Who likes those kind of movies where you see people just get hacked to pieces? Where do you think a guy like Samuel learned how to do that? I mean, he's a prophet. He's a preacher. Would your preacher hack somebody to pieces? <laughs> That's crazy, but I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. If I was going into battle, I would follow Samuel to battle. Because Samuel is willing to do the thing that God commanded him to do. Now, let me ask you this question. What do you think would be a more difficult scene to watch? Samuel hacking Agag to pieces or Jesus being crucified on the cross? Crucifixion. They're both pretty terrible, aren't they? Well, it's like crucifixion is like drawn out. So it is. It would hurt longer. Yeah. So I, I assume that would be worse. It would be. But... If you get hacked to pieces, maybe he starts by decapitating you. <laughs> maybe you get it over the If he's head. merciful, he stops up top. If he's not, he gets you at the ankles first, and he just works his way. Just like a team he works his way up. First Peter chapter three. Turn over to First Peter three. So we watch Agag, who is is evil. First Samuel fifteen says that he's a sinner. We watch evil get destroyed. And at the end of movies, when the bad guy gets it, we think, yes, right? The bad guy gets it, we cheer. Because evil has been destroyed. And there is a level of comfort in knowing that God destroys evil. Okay, The evil things in our lives, the wrong things that people get away with because they like, they, they excuse, they blame. It seems like they're pushing God around, but this story is a reminder that God will not be mocked. All right, uh, Evil will be handled. And yet on the cross, rather than man killing evil, what does Jesus take on himself? He allows all the wrong and the sin that we have done to rain down upon him. First, Jesus simply did what God said was the right thing to do. And when you think about Jesus up on the cross, our thinking is not, yeah, this is awesome. Our thinking is, is why. And our thinking does not need to be to walk out of here and say, I'm going to spot everyone else's lie and excuse and blame. When we look at the cross, we need to think of the things in our lives where we try and shift responsibility away from ourselves. And we need to let that be a mirror on our lives. Because here's the thing about when we give our lives to Christ in baptism, we are telling God to put evil to death in our own life. It's this huge moment where we're saying, God, I want you to take all this evil, and I want you to deal with it, and I want to be separated from it, and I don't want to be on that team anymore. So that's the, like, that's the killing blow right there. 
But I'll tell you what happened after Agag died. Guess what? There was a mess to clean up. You want to have cleaned up the, the, the hacked off pieces of Agag? Who cleaned up the mess after Jesus' crucifixion? Somebody had to clean up the mess after Jesus' crucifixion. After we give our lives to Christ, there's still some habits and some attitudes and some temptations that hang around. And so here's the last thing I want to share with you. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse 5. Somebody had to clean up this mess, and after God deals with our sin, we have to be a part of cleaning up what remains. Colossians 3, 5 says, Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And the way that we put to death those remaining things in our lives, the way we get that nasty, rotting remains of sin out of our lives, is when we confess our sins to God and to others. 